Okay, we're going to talk about the use of ultrasound in pediatric patients, both in terms of cardiac ultrasound and also some useful applications in the abdomen. When we look at the heart, uh, we want to use the, the P21 or the phased array transducer. It's got a small footprint, and so it's really good for getting in between the ribs and seeing the heart, which is uh, has to be sometimes a deeper structure in the body. So we have to get the sound to sort of penetrate deeper into the body, which is why we like to use this lower frequency, small footprint, phased array transducer. Whenever you look at the heart, I think it's helpful to look at it in multiple windows. The first window we think about is a sub-xiphoid uh, view, and uh, what you're going to do is you're going to sort of follow the liver edge along the subcostal margin until you can see the heart. And once you get around to the sub area, you're going to actually aim the beam towards the chin of the patient. Now, you always think about the heart sort of being on the left side of the screen, but uh, actually what we're really trying to do is aim the beam towards the patient's chin. And uh, in doing so, we still use that liver as our margin. You see, the sub view, it's necessary to use the liver as the window to see the heart. If we were to inadvertently aim the beam towards the patient's left, then we wouldn't have the liver anymore and we wouldn't be able to see the heart at all. We'd be shining the sound right up into the chest. So in patients who have really small livers for whatever reason, this sub view is not a very good window. The larger the liver, the better this window is. In order to get the liver to really come out from under the rib cage towards the probe, what you can do is have the patient take a deep breath. And what we see in the sub view is the following. Here's the liver, and then we can see the right ventricle, and then the left ventricle. Here's the right atrium, and here's the left atrium. So the right side of the heart is closer to the liver, whereas the left side of the heart is further down into the body. And we can see over here, once we have a pericardial effusion, it's seen as a separation between that sort of anterior pericardium and the myocardium. In fact, this pericardial effusion wraps itself all the way around, including around the posterior region of the heart as well. Now, about 15% of the time, because some patients have small livers um, or other issues, it's really difficult to obtain a sub view. So it's good to know um, some other tricks up your sleeve, such as the parasternal long axis. And as its name suggests, it's para next to sternum in the long axis of uh, the heart. And we use the cardiology orientation, which is where we take the indicator, and we aim it this way so that the apex is towards the indicator on the screen. So again, this parasternal view, here's our sternum right here. We're almost actually on top of the sternum. We're just to the side of it, and that's my indicator right there. We can see it's that little nipple with this little groove next to it. We're going to aim that, that, that indicator towards the patient's left. Therefore, the apex of the heart will be on the side of the screen where the indicator is. And we can see the indicator is over here, which is why the sort of apex of the heart is seen over here. We can see also here as well, apex of the heart towards the indicator because that's which way we aim the indicator. Now, this is a three-chambered view of the heart. We can see the right ventricle, and we can see the left ventricle, and here's the left atrium. And basically the blood is going from the left atrium through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then it gets pumped out the aortic outflow tract. A screening athletes for heart problems, Dr. Barry Ramo reveals how certain tests can save lives. It seems like every week we hear about competitive athletes dying suddenly on the playing field. The question is, should competitive athletes be periodically screened for heart problems before they compete? A recent study published in the British Medical Journal found if athletes were screened before an event, the risk of sudden cardiac arrest could be detected and lives could be saved. In Italy, where all athletes are screened, scientists looked at more than 30,000 athletes who underwent an electrocardiogram and found almost 5% of them had some heart abnormality that could lead to sudden death. According to researchers, a young athlete dies every three days from an undiagnosed heart problem in the U.S. That's because in most cases the problem goes undetected until they compete. The major cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes is a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Often patients with this problem will have a family history of the disease, there'll be a family history of sudden cardiac death, or they'll have some physical findings on examination. 
But the best test is an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. So far, we're not doing routine screening of athletes, whether they're professional athletes or whether they're just regular high school athletes. But that might be something in the future to weed out those kids who are at high risk for sudden cardiac death. For HealthBeat, I'm Dr. Barry Ramo, KOAT Action 7 News, live this morning. So with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what happens is the septum of the heart gets very thickened. And once it gets thickened, it gets harder for the blood to get pumped out the aorta. And you can see, in fact, this blood here doesn't even get out the aorta um, once, it, once the patient's exercise and this gets even a little bit enlarged. The blood can't get back out that aortic valve. And so what you can do is once you make the diagnosis, you can come in and, and inject alcohol in here and that shrinks down that interventricular septum, thereby making it easier for the, um, the blood to get out the aortic valve. Um, and the, the whole trick is picking up the diagnosis. It's very difficult to do on physical exam, if not impossible. You can see some of the symptoms listed there, but um, essentially um, what happens is the physical exam can only pick up about 3% of the patients before they experience sudden cardiac death. Um, one study found that the incidence of sudden cardiova cardiovascular death in young competitive athletes declined in the Veneto region in Italy by 89% once they introduced routine hypertrophic cardiomyopathy screening of athletes. And a bedside echocardiogram can detect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with 80% accuracy. What you're going to do is you're going to look at that septum. And we can see this is the septum in that parasternal long axis. That's why I'm always talking about the parasternal long axis because you can see that septum so well. And so at the end of systole, where it's the thickest, you would drop some calipers along this area right here. And if the calipers are less than 15 millimeters, then well, actually a normal septum is anywhere from 0 0.8 to 1.2 millimeters. Now, in somebody who undergoes a lot of exercise, sometimes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be mistaken for something known as athlete's heart. Now both involve a growth of the myocardium, however, um, athlete's heart is generally not correlated with the incidence of sudden cardiac death. While hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be linked to family history, athlete's heart arises purely as a function of intense exercise, usually at least an hour a day every day. Since the body is operating at high training levels, the heart adapts and grows in order to pump the blood more efficiently. Stoppage of exercise for three months generally leads to a decrease in the wall and the septum thickness in those with athlete's heart, whereas those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy exhibit no decline. So people with athlete's heart do not exhibit an abnormally enlarged septum and the growth of the heart muscle at the septum and the free ventricular wall is actually symmetrical. Whereas with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we see asymmetrical growth um, and a less uh, dilated left ventricle. This in turn leads to a smaller volume of blood that can leave the heart with each beat. Now, you can see that um, with athlete's heart, it's usually less than 15 millimeters at the septum, whereas in hypertrophic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is greater than 15 millimeters and um, it's not symmetric and we want to definitely get a good family history from these patients and if you're worried about it you can check them again in three months if they stop exercising and athletes heart to return to normal whereas um, it stays the same with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another thing that happens is um, you can get a systolic anterior motion of the anterior leaflet, which further obstructs the outflow tract. So here is a cardiac ultrasound showing a systolic anterior motion of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve during systole. So as the heart's squeezing during systole, look what happens. You can see that anterior leaflet flip up anteriorly and block that outflow tract. I'll get my arrow out of the way so you can see it and see if I can pause it right when it happens, right there. So we can see here at end systole, this leaflet flips up and actually occludes the flow of blood trying to get out of the aorta. That's another finding with hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. And you can see how thick this septum is here. Now, 
Um, switching gears a little bit now, talking about pericardial fluid, that's another thing you want to look for in um, kids. And um, what you look for is an anechoic or jet black fluid in the pericardial space. We see this with pericarditis. We see this with trauma. It can be from uremic uh, causes, malignant causes, and sometimes we don't know what causes it. Um, we see both acute and chronic uh, pericardial effusions, knowing full well that in the acute patient, um, actually anywhere from 80 to 200 cc's, depending on the age of the patient, is enough to cause um, the fluid in the pericardial space to be greater than the ability of the ventricle to fill. In other words, that's called pericardial tamponade, that the, the heart can no longer expand in the sac of fluid and the patient can die. Uh, now, chronically, you can see huge pericardial effusions. In fact, this picture here is uh, one in which we did an ultrasound-guided pericardiocentesis, and you can see this. It's about a liter of fluid that I drained off of a patient um, because she had uremic uh, pericarditis um, from uh, renal failure, and basically we were able to take a liter off her heart because it took so long to accumulate that the pericardium was able to stretch over a long period of time. But when you get stabbed, the pericardium can only accumulate uh, up to 200 cc's at the most before you get to pericardial tamponade. Now, sometimes the, the, air, the material can look echogenic with various shades of, of swirling um, echoes in there. You can see different types of effusions uh, like pus, um, if it's an infection, blood with vibrant or malignant um, effusions. And uh, the other thing is after somebody has a recent upper respiratory infection, we do see a lot of sort of um, physiologic, asymptomatic, trivial pericardial effusions. It's not, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to see that at all. I see this on models quite a bit, actually. So it's just something to think about. And then the next question somebody always asks me is, how can I measure the amount of fluid around the heart? Um, and the answer is you cannot using ultrasound. The only way to measure it really is to um, extract it. And so um, unfortunately, we can't really measure it. It's just you just sort of get an eyeball appearance of it. Um, basically, if there's more than a centimeter stripe of distance between the pericardium and the myocardium, that's when I start to get a little concerned about it. Less than a centimeter fluid stripe doesn't bother me too much. And you can see that these are one centimeter hash marks over here on the scale. And this is somebody who's got um, quite a large pericardial effusion. In fact, that was from the patient you just saw in that last image here. We drew a thousand cc's of fluid off this particular heart and I mean there's portions where there's like you know um, five centimeters of, of fluid basically between the between the pericardium and the myocardium. So this is a very large pericardial effusion. Here's a smaller one here and actually um, people are, are always asking me about this one. I'll just point out the reason I get questioned about it because people see this right here. They see these little um, material in the pericardial space and they say what is that stuff in there and I say uh, I don't know. I don't really care. I know that there is a pretty good size stripe here, more than a centimeter. And in fact, it stretches to go around posteriorly as well uh, around this patient's heart. So that's a little bit concerning. Um, but um, so yeah, so what's in there? I'm not sure. It could be some loculation, some fibrous material, could be some fat. Um, but my eye is really trained to look for the pericardial effusion in that subxiphoid view. Here's uh, another subxiphoid view showing another pericardial effusion, a couple centimeters there of a fluid stripe seen uh, anteriorly. We can also see that fluid marching around posteriorly as well. Um, now on the parasternal long axis, um, this is what a pericardial effusion looks like here. And we can see the heart swinging back and forth a bit. Uh, we see that when we see larger pericardial effusions. Uh, and so during um, systole, at the end of, end of systole, we can see the heart, the pericardium up here pull away, the myocardium pulls away from its pericardium. We also see it posteriorly as well. But if you look very closely, I want you to pay close attention to something here. This is the descending aorta. This circle right here is the descending aorta that we see on the parasternal long axis. And here is this pericardial effusion that tracked itself anterior to the descending aorta. In other words, it's between the left atrium and the descending aorta. We can see this wedge of fluid tracking up here. And that's what def defines this as a pericardial effusion. If this fluid was to track posteriorly behind the descending aorta, then we'd be more worried about a pleural effusion or fluid in the chest. Now this next scan is somebody who came in with abdominal pain, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, a fourth year medical student, 
uh, last summer, uh, did this study, went to the bedside, looked at the gallbladder, scanned it through the gallbladder, but in the corner of his eye, saw this down here on his scan and thought, that's strange, what is that? And focused in on it more, and look at this. This patient has quite a large pericardial uh, effusion there, and um, this patient actually ended up needing to go uh, to the um, cath lab to get a, uh, a pericardial pericardiocentesis. We can see there's two to three centimeters here of fluid between the anterior pericardium and the myocardium, um, and it was this was a, a big time inc incidentaloma, uh, incidental finding where we were looking for gallstones. The patient had abdominal pain. Yeah, there's some language barrier there. Um, they came for the abdominal pain. They stayed for the pericardial uh, pericardiocentesis. So, so what really is pericardial tamponade? Then you're probably wondering. Well, um, pericardial tamponade is when you have diastolic collapse of the right heart, and that's the main thing. So during diastole, you would expect the heart to fill. But if it paradoxically collapses during diastole, that's when there's so much fluid around the heart in the pericardium that it's causing the heart to collapse when it should be expanding. And, uh, and that's the sonographic definition. The clinical definition is large pericardial effusion plus hypotension or plus severe shortness of breath. Um, sometimes we see stuff around the heart. It could be epicardial fat, so you want to be a little careful there. Um, what do you think is going on in this view here? A couple things I can see. Number one, uh, it's a subxiphoid view. This is the liver here. We can see the pericardium tracing out here. This is the myocardium, and it's a little subtle, but do you see this area right here that's adjacent to the myocardium? That's epicardial fat. Now, this image is overgained. Yes, like you, I feel like I need to wear sunglasses when I look at it, uh, but just keep in mind that this is a, a fat pad here. However, this out here is something different. What do you think this is? So far, the pericardial effusions that you've seen have all been anechoic, but this one's got basically some echoes to it here, and this is what a, uh, a clot looks like. This is a basically a patient who's got tamponade with a blood clot in the peri uh, pericardium. How do I know this is tamponade? Well, look at during diastole, we see the, um, the trampoline effect. It looks like there's uh, a little tiny person jumping up and down on this patient's right ventricle, and it actually, the right ventricle um, decreases during diastole, and that's the sonographic definition of tamponade right there. Also, uh, this patient was very symptomatic, very short of breath. Now, the other thing that we can see is uh, cardiac standstill. This is actually a video of a heart that's no longer moving. It looks like a still image, but it's not. It's actually a video. And uh, these are the chambers here. Sometimes the heart is hard to pick out when it's not moving. You're used to seeing the heart move. Uh, but when the patient uh, expires uh, and the heart stops moving, um, we can see it here. And um, there's been several studies to, sh to show that once the patient has cardiac standstill, they have uh, a near universal 0% um, survival rate. And so this may be one particular endpoint that, um, that you may be looking for in some of your codes. Now, here's a patient who was in a car accident. Um, it was a blunt, blunt uh, traumatic full arrest. And when we have a patient with blunt traumatic full arrest, what uh, we usually think there's really not much we can do for them. With penetrating trauma to the chest with pericardial effusion, we immediately do um, a, a, a thoracotomy. But with blunt trauma, it's less clear. Well, in this particular patient here, um, they didn't actually have a pulse at all. We felt no carotid pulse, yet we saw this heart beating around quite a bit, swinging around in its sack of fluid there. Clearly, this is pericardial tamponade. In the setting of blunt trauma, it was a little bit confusing. Um, when you look at the mechanism a little bit closer, the patient wasn't wearing a seatbelt, hit the sternum, and uh, probably a rib fractured and poked the, 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 uh, the pericardium, causing this um, pericardial tamponade. And, and so what's the next step in the trauma bay when we have somebody who's got blunt traumatic full arrest with pericardial tamponade? Um, well, the next step in the trauma bay is not to do a pericardiocentesis, but rather do this, which is a thoracotomy. Okay, and so um, we did. Um, we use the ribs. You know, we cut the patient open, um, and then we use the rib spreaders to spread apart the ribs, and we get all these clots out of the chest and out of the, out of the pericardium as well. Um, and when you continue the thoracotomy all the way to the other side, um, that's called a clamshell. Um, but it's something we always look for now in our blunt trauma patients and who are in cardiac arrest to uh, to try to 
rescue them from that. And the person that you see right here, has, it did did come back to life and actually was discharged from the hospital, um, even though they got an, uh, an emergency department thoracotomy. So we've had several patients now over the years survive in, um, an emergency department thoracotomy um, who had blunt traumatic pull arrest. Now, I'm switching gears now. I'm going to talk about um, CT scans in kids. And I know this is an ultrasound talk, but I want to just bring your attention to something that many of you may not be aware of, and that's that we've had an unbelievable increase in the amount of CAT scanning going on uh, throughout our emergency departments. And this was a study published three years ago showing just that, um, that over the last, of the prior six years, from 2000 to 2006, we saw just gigantic increases in the amount of CT scans for the various uh, modalities. And this is not in adults, this is, this is all in, in kids. And so it's something to be concerned about because um, kids respond to radiation uh, a little bit differently. And, uh, and as this chart shows here, um, kids, they basically have more radiosensitive tissue and they live a longer life and so cancer can develop um, it can take a longer, in certain cancers that take a longer time to develop, they will um, develop in, in younger people at, because they have longer time to live to get those cancers. And so um, this is um, what happens when you get um, this increase in CT scans. You can see here, this is the estimated radiation-induced cancer risk um, in kids compared to adults. And as friendly as we try to make our, our CT scanners for kids, it's really not a friendly thing to do to a kid to, um, to, to CT them. Let me show you this here. This is an excess cancer mortality rate um, by age at exposure. And so here is the number of, um, this is basically 100 millisieverts of, um, of radiation um, uh, and the number of cancer deaths per 100,000 patients who were exposed to 100 millisieverts of radiation. So that's a couple of CT scans. Um, two or three CT scans uh, right there. And so you can see if, if at an early age, basically this is the, the fulcrum right here. Once you're below the age of 35 and you're exposed to, you know, three CT scans or so, you have um, significantly higher rates of cancer than when you get it when you're over the age of, of 35. So it's just something to think about. Um, I try to really curtail my use of CT scans in younger patients whenever I can. One particular strategy was suggested by uh, Lamaris in 2009 who said, well, what if we used ultrasound first and then CT scans? This was uh, 1,021 patients um, for the diagnosis of urgent conditions. And uh, while CT was significantly more sensitive than ultrasound, it is a better test um, in terms of its accuracy. The overall highest sensitivity actually used a combined approach using initial ultrasound, then CT, and this actually was able to reduce radiation by 50%. So that's something to think about. If we got good, if we got better with ultrasound and really thought about it a lot more, especially in kids, we could um, avoid the need for CT scans. So in about, about half the time. So I'm going to go through how we could use it in the pediatric abdomen now in terms of three potential diagnoses, pyloric stenosis, intussusception, and uh, appendicitis. So um, it turns out that ultrasound in kids are, are good matches for one another. Kids are very, um, what I call, sonogenic. And it's because they don't have a lot of fat, basically. And they're small, so we can use higher frequency transducers. And they have a lot of cartilage compared to the amount of um, ossified bone. And so ultrasound goes right through cartilage very easily. It does, once the bones get, get ossified and they get you know very dense, the sound gets reflected. So kids have lots of cartilage, which is which is nice for ultrasound. And um, as opposed to putting somebody, a, a child, who's squirming around in a CT scanner where they have to sit still, you can actually put the child, plop the child right down in mom's lap and uh, scan the child uh, right there without any sedation at all. So you don't need um, to sedate them, which um, has mixed, uh, you know, if, if you, whenever you sedate a kid, um, you have to sort of control their airway and it puts them at risk uh, for a complication there. So we do it when we need to, but if we can avoid that, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. And this is an example here of uh, a patient who's got appendicitis. And this is what it looks like. This is the, the skin line up here. This is some muscle. And this is the appendix swollen uh, right here. And it's uh, greater than 6 millimeters. It's actually wall-to-wall -wall measures 1.03 centimeters. And that's what acute appendicitis looks like. 
Um, which probe do you think we're going to use? Well, um, normally when we look in the abdomen on adults, we have to use this probe here. Uh, but on kids, we actually get to use this probe here, my favorite probe, because it's got such high frequency and makes such pretty images. Now, one of the techniques that uh, you want to use whenever you work with kids, um, of course, um, you want to use a high frequency linear probe with the patient in a parent's lap. Lie the patient to pine as best you can. It actually helps to bend their knees a little bit, too. Um, but um, it's this part right here, warm gel. It's amazing how the cold gel in the kid can... You know, it's like you're bringing a little squirrel over to eat a nut out of your hand, and all of a sudden you freak them out with the, with the cold gel. So put some warm gel on there. Uh, we have a gel warmer uh, that we keep a bottle set aside for kids with. Uh, in our, it's actually in our heater for our warm blankets as well. So um, that's the way to go. Now, um, let's first talk about pyloric stenosis. So pyloric stenosis is where you get um, thickening of uh, the hypertrophy of the pyloric muscle here. And um, it occurs in about 1 to 250 kids at a male to female ratio, 4 to 1, very, very early in life. You know, that neonate that comes in with non bilious projectile vomiting, every single one of these kids is um, consideration for um, pyloric stenosis. Now, on physical exam, it's historically shown that um, you want to palpate the olive. And basically, you push around on the abdomen trying to feel this thing right here, which is this. Um, stenotic uh, hypertrophy pyloric valve and actually palpating the ol olive was only shown to be uh, present in about 23 percent of, of patients um, whereas ultrasound has a very good test characteristics to pick up um, pylor pyloric stenosis now the ultrasound images of the gastric pylorus um, when it's greater than 1.6 centimeters uh, in length or four millimeters in thickness. And so right here, this is the length right here. If that distance from here to here is greater than 1.6, or if the thickness is greater than four millimeters, then we think about um, pyloric stenosis. Um, and you do this in real time, and you'll see peristaltic waves from the proximal stomach, um, which do not transmit the fluid down through the fundus. So this is the proximal stomach here, and um, we they'll be peristalsing, the stomach will be squeezing, but it can't get the fluid through this stenotic uh, pylorus. Um, some of the limitations here is if the patient's crying, you have to kind of do this between the cries. So if the patient goes, wah, you can't really do it then, but when they, between the cries, and they go to take a breath, everything relaxes, and that's when you can get in and get a good view. So sometimes you, you only get the view while they're crying between uh, the cries. And um, if there's a lot of bowel gas, if, if you're, Actually, if the patient has a bowel obstruction, there's a lot of bowel gas everywhere. This can be a somewhat difficult um, study to do. And if they've been crying a lot, sometimes they swallow out of air. And we know air is the enemy of ultrasound. So instead of being nice fluid in here or formula, whatever this is, there's air in there, and that can get in your way. So that has a couple of the limitations. Um, but a lot of times when the child vomits, a lot of gas comes out of the stomach, and we actually get um, rid of that air. So vomiting can be a helpful thing when doing ultrasound. So the technique is basically you want to give the patient some clear fluid to drink, um, some Pedialyte, and let them suck that down uh, if they can, and uh, that will really make this uh, job way easier. And aim the indicator of the patient's right, and then um, you start in that kind of right upper quadrant area down towards, or should I say over towards the epigastric area, and um, in the transverse section it looks like a donut, and you just saw what it looked like in the longitudinal section. These are the two views here. We can see the pyloric uh, canal length if it's greater than 14 millimeters if the thickness is greater than 3 millimeters and if the diameter um, I should say the diameter uh, here is more than um, 11 millimeters um, that's uh, suggestive of uh, pyloric stenosis we can see it over here to the diameter whereas the uh, muscle um, thickness is going to be from here to here this is the muscle thickness here and that's if that's greater than three millimeters, we worry about pyloric stenosis. So those are the three things. The canal length, the diameter, and then the muscle thickness here. Um, again, this is how it looks uh, when it's positive. And we're going to change gears now and talk about intussusception. Now, intussusception is where you have telescop telescoping of the bowel segments. 
So you get the, um, and I had to kind of relearn this anatomy here, the intussusceptum is what telescopes into um, the intussusceptions. Intussusceptions. Intussus Can't pronounce it, obviously. Uh, but that's the idea. You get this, this is called intussusception. And this is what it looks like uh, when you're in the operating room and you're, and you're demonstrating it uh, real time. And it causes full-blown intestinal obstruction. So patients come in with, not surprisingly, the triad of colicky, abdominal pain, vomiting, and bloody stools. Unfortunately, that classic triad, like all classics in medicine, is only present about 20% of the time. The typical age range is three months up to two years. Now, there is something um, called the uh, current jelly stools. It's where you have blood plus poop. It comes out looking like this, current uh, jelly. And... Um, Luckily, ultrasound, very, very good with interception. It's got about a 100% uh, sensitivity to pick it up. And the way you do this is um, you can, um, this is an example here of placing the patient in a warm uh, water bath here um, and holding the legs together as we're doing the ultrasound. And by s holding the legs together, specifically by sort of squeezing uh, the buttocks together, um, that can... Um, help actually reduce some of this um, and, and fix the problem. But to diagnose it though, we're here with the ultrasound probe and we're looking at the ascending and then across to the transverse colon, any areas that's non-peristaltic because these intussusceptions, they don't peristalse. Normally peristalsis occurs um, about every eight to 10 seconds, um, but you can stare at this bowel, it's not gonna peristalse. And you'll see a mast or a target sign. Now this is what normal intestine looks like. It's got sort of a layered appearance. It's easily compressible, and it's got intermittent peristalsis. This is, we can see here on, on the long axis of this bowel, kind of cruising along, there's air in it. And so the air makes it so we can't see the rest of the bowel, which is normal. And in a short axis between peristalsis, this is normal bowel here, seen in a short axis here. When it's, it's uh, in the middle of peristalsis, all the air gets kind of pushed aside and we see the actual rugae here of the bowel. And that's what normal bowel looks like um, in a normal patient. These are blood vessels down here. And this is, again, what normal intestine looks like up here. Now, within a susception, on the other hand, here's the problem. In the short axis, it really does look like a donut. It's got this target configuration. In a long axis, we call this the, uh, sometimes it's called the A-fork sign or the pseudo-kidney sign. And, um, but this is what that, that target shape looks like. You can see why ultrasound is such good test characteristics here to, to pick up um, this because it's got that target uh, formation. Here's another example here of the uh, target sign of uh, in a susception. We can see layers of bowel um, seen with that hyperchoic segment around that uh, inner layer there. This is basically like a little target uh, symbol there. It's all that bowel invaginating in, um, with the mesentery in it and that's what causes these layers. And uh, here's another example here of uh, in a susception, and, and we wrote on here no peristalsis seen. Um, again, it's that targeted layered appearance. Um, another example here of a pretty straightforward case. We see layers of bowel along with the hyperchoic segment around the inner layer um, due to the invagination of the uh, mesentery that came through here. This is the actual video of this patient. Um, we're right around that epigastric area under the liver. We moved it over to the right upper quadrant, and it's uh, where the ascending, the transverse colon came together. We can see the uh, intussusception um, starting to appear right there. And uh, that's, that's it right there. There's actually kind of a long axis of it right there. Now we're in short at the end of it. So that's the um, kind of what we're looking for. Now, changing gears, uh, one final time we're going to talk about appendicitis, one of my favorite topics. Um, this is the most common surgical emergency in children. Uh, in children, the peak of appendicitis is between age 9 and 12 years old. And uh, again, fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, anorexia, right lower quadrant pain, generalized abdominal pain that then localizes itself uh, to the right lower quadrant. It turns out about a third of kids present without that classic presentation. And so whenever you have something that's not presenting classically, you got to turn to imaging. And, um, and uh, you, could, you could get an x-ray, but um, can you maybe get lucky and see what's called an appendicolith. That's basically um, translates to essentially a poop stone sitting in the appendix. What happens is um, a very 
sort of hardened calcified um, stool can occlude the lumen of the appendix as it comes off the cecum and that's what's known as an appendicular and the other thing you can see around that area is a focal ileus in that region or, or um, where the bowel stops um, with so like a focal bowel obstruction is what that means. So um, we get a surgery consult in a lot of these patients um, and the first thing the surgeons many times um, well historically have, have turned to has been CT scans. Lately though I've noticed that especially our surgeons at UCR are getting very good about using CT as a last resort and so that's been very uh, reassuring to me uh, the approach to, uh, to appendicitis. Um, but you can see why they've historically have turned to CT scans. The sensitivity for CT is actually um, with the new CT scans, uh, multi-detectors, it's all up around 96 percent, 98 percent. It's very, very good. Now with ultrasound, the sensitivity uh, depends, it's a very operator dependent thing and some people are really good at doing these, other people aren't. It takes a lot of patience. Um, the, the lower specificity that we see with ultrasound has to do with the fact that it's really difficult to see a normal appendix and in fact even in the best of hands a normal appendix is seen less than 15 percent of the time so feast your eyes on that my friends that is a normal appendix which you rarely if ever see we can see the iliac artery here and it's just kind of stretching out over the iliac artery along its um, this was an 18 year old woman I had who had right lower quadrant abdominal pain and on this l longitudinal scan we're able to see the, uh, the longitudinal scan of the appendix, I should say the long axis of the appendix. We're able to see this tubular blind ended structure with nice thin walls. And if you measure from, from outer wall to outer wall, okay, here to here, here to here, here to here, you're going to get less than five millimeters. Um, and that's normal. If you can get up to six millimeters to have a normal appendix. Now, just to show you on a CT scan what it looks like, this is abdominal skin out here. This is fat. Uh, we can see all this around the, the body here. So this is actually the human being here, and this is all society uh, influence out here. This is all just fat and stuff. So, um, and that's w where ultrasound can be difficult if you have to compress all this fat here um, in order to get to see the, the muscle. So this is ab abdominal oblique muscle. This is the rectus abdominal a muscle here and we can see this thickened appendix um, right here and we can see the psoas muscle over here so the idea is to compress this abdominal wall musculature until the appendix gets squished between abdominal oblique sometimes the appendix is a lot more medial and we can actually or end up compressing this rectus muscle or abdominal oblique all the way down until you come in contact with the psoas muscle and if you have acute appendicitis the appendix gets stuck between these two muscle layers with ultrasound. So you're pushing the probe way out here and squishing the tissue all the way down. So you can imagine how much pain medication you may have to give a patient in order for them to allow you to compress it. And so basically that's what you're doing. You're just kind of, it's like, you know, you wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and then all of a sudden um, you should see the appendix eventually pop its head out at you, and then as fast as you can see it, it's gone again because you you moved past the area then you go oh wait wait back up and then you go back and you're like wait for it wait for it you're compressing you're compressing and then all of a sudden boop, pops this out at you and then you can freeze the image and show that to somebody it's kind of what we're seeing here um, we're going along we can see some bowel peristalsis in here here's psoas muscle right here and psoas muscle is being compressed you're, you're basically the probe is up here on the skin line sub subcutaneous fat here's muscle right here and we're going to push that abdominal wall musculature all the way down until it comes in contact with psoas. And we can see some psoas right here. And here's a loop of bowel right here. Maybe that's the appendix. I'm not sure. But it gets squirt, squirts out of the way. Here's some iliac vessel here. That appendix is becomes um, ovoid and squishes out of the way. And it's nicely peristalsing. So in this case, this is definitely a negative study in from what we can see so far. I should say no appendicitis visualized is the way you kind of document it. But that's the idea. Here's another case. I'm going to show you a bunch of positives now. Um, this is, um, so we can see some abdominal wall musculature here. Maybe this is rectus. Maybe this is um, abdominal oblique. And here's what it looks like when it's positive. It's a non-compressible tubular structure. This one measured to almost a centimeter uh, wall to wall there, outside wall to outside wall to the appendix there. And let's see, here's another one here. 
uh, I think uh, they came to here they're going to measure this sort of outside wall to outside wall and I would actually drop the caliper right here I think this is an example of where not to drop the caliper but the idea is you want to go here to here so it's a little bit less than eight probably seven still abnormal um, and on this case here we're just doing a lot of compressing and no matter what how hard we compress we're look walking around everywhere um, compressing here's here's some psoas muscle here's some bowel peristalsis with some air in it abdominal oblique we see loops of bowel fluted here's psoas muscle right here coming we saw psoas it looks like psoas is coming up this way what's happening is we're pushing this all the way down towards psoas right so all this tissue is compressible we never see the appendix we see a lot of peristalsis bowel but we don't actually see the appendix here and um, and that's just that's part of the study so when you practice on this this is likely what you're going to see on a normal individual just so as coming all the way up and coming in contact with your abdominal oblique and this patient here has got acute appendicitis we can see this blind ended tubular structure um, we're doing a lot of compression it's a non compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant this one's eight millimeters so this is kind of the idea here's here's without compression this is a still image protocol without compression this is with compression here we see the psoas muscle is here we see the iliac artery iliac vein and then when we compress them together here's psoas and here's the appendix it's uh, it's, it's non-compressible we're able to squirt out away some of the free fluid when you see free fluid like that um, it actually helps to outline the appendix you can see it easier and uh, that free fluid um, maybe one of the tip-offs that there's been perforation of the appendix and these patients may be quite sick, have elevated white blood cell counts, be febrile, um, and require immediate um, IV antibiotics and surgical consultation. I've noticed that more and more lately with uh, perforated appendicitis, patients are getting IV antibiotics and, um, and not surgery, um, depending, and that's a case-by-case -case thing, but it seems like the trend is towards conservative therapy with IV antibiotics and setting perforated appendicitis rather than going in and uh, doing... Um, uh, wash out. So um, to conclude here, I just want to show you this is uh, what we want to do with the ultrasound technique. It's good to have a full bladder. I know that sounds uncomfortable, but that's part of it. The way we get around some of the discomfort of doing appendicitis ultrasound is with analgesia. Um, I'm a big fan of a short-acting narcotic like fentanyl, um, which can be given and it's you push it, the patient feels great. 20 minutes later, it's out of their system. Um, that's why I like that drug. And any short-acting narcotic will work that way. Um, you want to start at the area where the patient tells you they are maximally tender. I hand the probe to the kid and say, here you go, push on the push on your skin where it hurts and look up at the TV screen and let's see what see if we can find what's bothering you. And the kid sort of gets into it. It's like a video game. Um, and again, it's the psoas, psoas muscle. You want to be able to identify the iliac vessels and not call those appendicitis. This is just um, another example here of appendicitis. Here we can see a fecalith or a, a poop stone in the distal appendix causing um, a shadowing here. And, um, and that's nice when you can see them. It's kind of kind of rare, but when you see one, it's pretty cool on ultrasound. It looks just like any other stone does, kidney stone, gallstone. Otherwise, it exudes some shadowing. So in general, ultrasound is a great alternative to doing a CT scan. We want to think about giving the patient some analgesia. It's important to have the patient in the right position of comfort and always look at things um, in two views. We've talked a lot about um, the pylorus and the um, intestines and the uh, heart. We, and all these, whenever I mention organ, you'll notice there's a recurring theme here. I talk about looking at things in two different views. And you're reconstructing that anatomy in your brain in a three-dimensional image. Um, and that will come to you over time. Target signs with um, indecision. And I think about ultrasound in terms of ruling it in because it has a poor specific, ultrasound has a poor specificity for appendicitis, so I can't really rule it out, um, but it does help to avoid a CT scan if I can rule it in. Now, just one more thing, um, just to keep in mind, uh, again, for CT scans, um, that the one of the ways I explain to patients who, sometimes patients are kind of demanding they want a CT scan right now, and if I think I can get there another way, or if I can talk them out of it, this is one way I say that, a CT scan of your abdomen and pelvis is like getting 500 chest x-rays. A CT scan of your chest is like 400. You can read all these here. Um, and then if you look up the number of chest x-rays 
worth of radiation for an ultrasound, it, it's still zero. Thank you very much.